morning, everyone. Um, it's a, a smaller crowd here, but I think online we have uh, a whole lot of people, so uh, that's great. Uh, welcome to the spring edition of the uh, Debbie Smith and Frank HR Employment Law Seminar. Um, for those of you that haven't been here before or haven't been to one of these, uh, we're going to follow the same uh, protocol as usual. We're going to try and get through uh, as many of the seminars as we can quickly and uh, try and hold any and all questions until the end. Um, we have a shorter roster of uh, presenters today, uh, just myself and Marty, so uh, shorter list of uh, topics to get through, but hopefully we can address them in a little bit more detail than we've been able to do in the past. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get you guys on your way to uh, your busy days and uh, back out into the rain. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, so topic number one uh, that uh, is going to uh, be presented by myself. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Larry. Uh, I'm the managing partner here at the firm. Um, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Gallia and uh, Walmart Canada Corp. Um, it's a decision that came out in December of 2017, so it's about uh, four or five months old. Um, it is a Superior Court uh, decision of Justice Emery, and it deals with uh, aggravated and punitive damages. And uh, so it's an opportunity for us to talk about both of those uh, subjects in a little bit more detail. Uh, the decision is uh, actually 48 pages long, so it uh, goes on for quite a bit, um, and it is uh, a nice summary of the areas, and it also has a few interesting twists to it, um, in addition to the result, which is fairly extraordinary. So, um, aggravated damages generally uh, relate to uh, award of damages uh, typically in addition to a uh, uh, breach of contract or notice uh, obligation uh, award, and it relates to pain and suffering, mental distress, uh, those kinds of damages that are suffered by uh, employees. Uh, it is very infrequently awarded, um, and uh, so when we have a case where one is where we have some damages like that awarded, uh, it's, it's of news uh, worthiness. Um, Similarly, uh, punitive damages uh, are also uh, a, a very rare uh, award, and so when we have a case that does actually award punitive damages, it, it, it's something to talk about. Um, so uh, Gallia is important uh, on, on both of those because in, in Gallia, both heads of damages uh, were awarded. Um, so um, let's start with the facts. The facts uh, are quite long, but... Um, Ms. Gallia began working at Walmart in 2002. Uh, she was hired initially as a district manager in training, and uh, she uh, was consistently praised for her work and nominated for future leadership positions throughout the course of her uh, employment. Um, she was uh, eventually admitted to the elite training program at Walmart, uh, which was designed to train and prime uh, individuals for senior executive levels. And uh, although she worked for Walmart Canada, uh, she began to be recognized uh, by uh, a number of the international divisions of Walmart throughout her employment. Um, so during these seven years that she was employed there, uh, she uh, was promoted on uh, several occasions. She was promoted to district manager, then regional manager, regional vice president, general merchandising manager, vice president of, of general merchandising. So, a lot of uh, promotions uh, in, in very short order. Um, all of her performance appraisals uh, came back with ridiculously high scores. She, she almost always exceeded expectations. Um, and she moved from an initial salary of $120,000 to uh, being uh, able to access the, the executive uh, program and the bonus programs that were associated with the uh, executive positions that she ultimately held and her compensation rose to uh, 400 to $600,000 uh, a year uh, by 2010 when she was terminated. Um, in January of 2010, uh, she, she met with her uh, immediate supervisor who was the CEO and president of Walmart Canada, Mr. Cheesewright. Um, and Mr. Cheesewright uh, told her that her role had been eliminated 
and that he frankly didn't know what to do with her. Um, so um, he, he advised her that she wasn't ready for uh, the chief merchandising officer role um, and that uh, there was a number of options that might be available to her, including uh, positions in India, uh, positions in Walmart Brazil, um, and a number of other uh, opportunities as he described them. Um, it, it, the, the problem was that uh, over the course of the next 10 months or so, uh, Ms. Gallia was never really assigned to anything uh, of any meaningful, uh, any meaningful role. Uh, she, she was uh, appointed as a, as a consultant for one of the U.S. individuals. She uh, was, uh, uh, she met with a number of uh, individuals in Chile and in Brazil and Eventually, um, she was, uh, you know, just put in a role where she really had no management duties. She really had no one uh, reporting to her, and, and she really had no defined job duty at all, in fact. So, um, at some point, she, she went to Harvard for a training program for eight weeks, and it was, it was kind of like she was keeping herself busy looking for, for an actual real role that wasn't a demotion um, within Walmart. Um, in November 2010, um, eventually, uh, Mr. Cheesewright met with her again, and she was ultimately uh, terminated. Um, so um, that sort of ended that. Um, the aftermath of all of that was that Walmart continued to pay her for the next 11 and a half months, but um, then stopped. Um, the court ultimately held that she had a two-year term contract. So by, by cutting her off at the 11 and a half month mark, uh, Walmart effectively cut her off early and, and breached that provision of the agreement. Um, they also canceled health and dental, dental benefits. Um, and so, of course, she commenced an action. Um, the result, which is you know, what first brings this case to everyone's attention, um, is uh, the court uh, found that she was entitled to uh, uh, loss of wages, benefits, and bonus payments for breach of contract, totaling $915,000. Um, and the math on that's a bit complicated because it's a whole series of calculations under the various bonus plans and executive pay plans that she was entitled to. But ultimately, when you do the math, it adds up to $915,000. Um, the more interesting part of the case, though, is that uh, she was awarded $250,000 in aggravated damages and $500,000 in punitive damages. Um, so, you know, th those awards in and of themselves are, are uh, uh, sort of extraordinary, and those amounts are, are certainly uh, extraordinary, which is certainly why we're talking about this case today. So, um, taking a little bit of a step back, aggravated damages generally arise from a very historic case called Hadley and Baxendale. And the test is, is simply whether damages were reasonably foreseeable uh, arising from the breach of the contract and whether the conduct of the employer was such that it causes the employee mental distress beyond the sort of ordinary hurt feelings that would normally arise from a termination. Um, and uh, the damages are meant to be compensable. And in, in other words, they're supposed to be in line with the the, the loss that's been suffered by the employee, um, and, and they're designed to compensate them for the hurt feelings and the lost dignity and the loss of respect. Um, so, uh, you know, the existence of, of, the, of the ability to, to get aggravated damages has been around for a long time. Um, subsequently, uh, courts, uh, and in the case, the court refers to it more as moral damages. Um, and, and moral damages relates to an employer's duty to act in good faith and fair dealing in the manner of the dismissal of the employee. Um, and the courts, in particular, the Supreme Court of Canada has long held that employers have a duty, an implied duty, to be honest and candid and forthright with the employee in the manner of the dismissal. And some of you may be familiar with the Wallace and UGG case, which is a Supreme Court of Canada case from 1997. Um, and that's really the first time that the Supreme Court of Canada enunciated this duty that employers have. Um, and in that case, uh, you know, the court uh, uses similar sorts of languages in describing the duty, 
but the court in that case indicated that the, the damages awards would be would be granted by virtue of extending the employee's notice period. So if an employee had been entitled to 10 months of notice, um, if there were uh, circumstances which would give rise to a breach of the duty, the court in that case said, well, in that case, you can extend the notice period to 12 months or 15 months or, or some other uh, additional uh, extension of the notice period. And that's how the court's at least at that time, indicated that those damages were to be uh, awarded, and they indicated that that's how the employee was to be compensated for the losses that had been suffered. And there's a whole line of cases after Wallace and UGG uh, in 1997 talking about examples where an extended notice period would be appropriate because of breach of the duty of, of the uh, uh, good faith. And, you know, it arises in scenarios where um, uh, the, the employer, employee is fired, but they do it in a manner that it's very public or, or is embarrassing within the workplace. You know, they scratch and wipe their name off the, if they were on the, on the list on the, on the, on the chalkboard and they go up and wipe them off the list in front of everybody and, and things like that. So there's a whole uh, list of examples of, of what would give rise to a breach of the duty. Um, the law changed considerably in 2008 when Keys and Honda uh, was decided by the Supreme Court of Canada. And the Supreme Court of Canada basically said, yes, listen, that, that duty that is enunciated in Wallace, is it, it's a real duty and it, it exists at law, but we really shouldn't be extending the notice period in order to compensate the individuals for these losses. These are really just aggravated damages. And, and so the court really should look at this as a Hadley and, and uh, Baxendale principle. And if this kind of behavior is reasonably contemplated, uh, as to cause mental distress to the employee, it should be compensable. And it should be compensable not by virtue of extending the notice periods, but by virtue of awarding a damages award of aggravated damages. Um, and the court specifically gave the, the examples in that case of, you know, an attack on the employee's reputation at the time of dismissal or a misrepresentation as the reasons for the termination. You know, if the employer says it's for X when really it's for Y, that's, that's the kind of thing that will give rise to an aggravated damages claim and a mental distress claim. Um, and so the court in, in, in Galley and, and Walmart uh, talked about both of those cases and talked about that history and basically acknowledged that that history existed. Um, the court though went on to sort of say, listen, it doesn't just relate to the manner of the dismissal, it could relate to conduct by the employee employer before the termination um, and in this case, that's sort of the floundering period that, that Ms. Gallia was put through between January and November of 2010 when she really had no role and had no, no actual sort of placement. Um, or it could relate to post-termination conduct. And in, in this particular case, it was the stopping of the payments before the two-year fixed term, i.e. only paying the 11 and a half uh, uh, months instead. Um, and the court also talked about the fact that it may relate to conduct of the employer during the litigation, which is a, a fairly novel uh, concept. You know, usually litigation conduct is uh, sort of dealt with in the costs considerations. But the court in this case said, listen, there were delays in answering undertakings and in producing the documents in the litigation itself. And that's all just part and parcel of Walmart's mistreatment of Ms. Gallia in this particular case. Um, so, um, oops, sorry, um, going the wrong way, um, still going the wrong way. So the court held on the aggravated damages front that the decision uh, to keep Ms. Galley in suspended animation for the 10 months was unduly insensitive, that she was really left to twist in the wind and the court decided that that merited an aggravated damages award of $200,000. Um, the court also found that the conduct of Walmart during the litigation was relevant and, and the delays and the disrespect to the lawyers. And so as a result of that particular misconduct, the court awarded an additional aggravated damages award of $50,000 to get us to the $250,000. So, um, fairly uh, aggressive numbers and, and fairly severe, um, uh, you know, sort of look at it. Um, but the court was, was quite upset with uh, 
the treatment of Ms. Galia by Walmart, and and the court, you know, basically said it, it's it's beyond insensitive. It was, it was just plain mean the way they the way they the way they conducted themselves. Um, the um, other aspect of the case, which is not in my slides, but um, you know, the court also sort of found all of uh, this uh, uh, result in the mental distress without really a lot of medical evidence. And there was a lot of discussion, um, or some discussion in the case, I'm sorry, about the fact that you, you don't really need medical evidence, you don't need expert evidence in order to award aggravated damages. You, you really can look at the, the uh, facts as a whole, and, and Ms. Gallia, um, in this particular case, <clears throat> had taken extensive notes. She had quotes of almost every conversation that had happened. Um, so the court found that, you know, the, the impact on her uh, was... was uh, sufficient to, to award the damages award without the necessity to have even medical documentation to prove the mental distress aspects of it. Um, the court went further though and, and uh, decided to award punitive damages. Um, <clears throat> now punitive damages uh, are, are really damages awarded against the defendant and, and are really not damages related to any loss of the plaintiff. So really, they're designed to be penal in nature, and, and they're designed to sort of send a message to a particular defendant that this kind of conduct is, is not something that's going to be uh, condoned by the courts. Um, they are very exceptionally awarded, and the, the language that's used is, is often is, is that the conduct is malicious, oppressive, or high-handed, and it offends the court's sense of decency. So. In this particular case, the court uh, um, also considered uh, the proportionality of it all and whether or not, you know, in addition to the $250,000 and the other damages that have been awarded, whether the, the blameworthiness of the defendant warranted an additional extraordinary award. Um, and, and the court uh, decided that it was particularly heinous in this case um, and um, that in order to effectively deter the behavior of Walmart in the future, um, the award, award needed to be a larger amount. Um, the court took a look at some of the other uh, punitive damages awards that have happened in the past, and, and the court took some uh, guidance or solace, maybe, um, from the fact that there had been a $450,000 punitive damages award um, in, a, in a previous case. Um, the court also took specific note of uh, the Boucher and Walmart case, which is a court of appeal case from 2014, um, which I think we've talked about in, in some of our earlier seminars in the past. Um, and in that case, uh, punitive damages awards were also awarded against Walmart. Um, and uh, the jury uh, at, at the trial level awarded a million dollar da punitive damages award. And the court of appeal later reduced that amount to $100,000. Um, so uh, Mr. Justice Emery, in, in, the, in the current case, um, took a look at that case and, and decided that um, in, in the Boucher case, uh, a lot of the, um, shall I say, heinous behavior was, was put forward by a particular employee, a particular officer of Walmart, and that it wasn't sort of more of a corporate um, uh, uh, behavior. And so the $100,000 was sort of decided to be a more appropriate number because, you know, Walmart as, a, as, an, as an entity wasn't as, as particularly culpable. The court in this case found that that's not really the case. There wasn't one particular officer or one particular individual at Walmart that, that was responsible. It was more of a general corporate culture that was, was problematic here. And so based on all of that, um, the court came down on uh, a five hundred thousand uh, dollar punitive damages award against Walmart. Um, so, uh, uh, pr pretty pretty uh, significant amount of money on that front. Um, so, uh, <laughs> interesting case. Um, certainly something to to take note of. Um, at least uh, as far as we can tell, there's been no appeal of that award, so that case appears as though it's going to stand for, for what it uh, says at the uh, Superior Court level. It has not been pushed up to the Court of Appeal. Um, so uh, we, we, I think, can draw a few conclusions from the existence of the case. 
Number one, um, aggravated and punitive damages are certainly alive and well in uh, Ontario and in employment law generally, um, and they are becoming more commonplace, it seems, and the award numbers do seem to be climbing generally. So um, something to be very careful about. Um, secondly, uh, duty of good faith to employees uh, in the manner of the dismissal, both before, after, and in the course of the litigation that follows uh, is, is something that employers need to be uh, aware of. And, um, you know, <clears throat> just because the termination has happened doesn't mean that the duty is at an end. And if there are uh, behaviors that, that take place thereafter, it, they can attract damages awards. So um, need, need to be very careful about the manner of the dismissal and the conduct thereafter. Um, and then lastly, uh, I guess a more obvious point at the end, but um, it's important to obey the contractual terms and entitlements of the employees. Um, you know, I, I think Walmart would have done a lot better in this particular case had they continued to pay Ms. Gallia for the full two years. Um, you know, the sort of unilateral decision to cut her off at 11 and a half months and to terminate her benefits um, when there really was no contractual um, reason to do so and, and no sort of, you know, even gray area to do so, uh, I think was, was something that really impacted on them uh, in this particular case. So um, it may be obvious, but, you know, make sure that when you're dealing with the terminations that uh, you're obeying the contractual terms and the entitlements of the employees to uh, avoid sort of getting into the aggravated and punitive damages scenarios thereafter. Thank you. Um, and uh, up next, uh, Marty is going to come up and talk to you about Bill 148.